Hello, welcome to this workshop, Creating an Instant and Seamless Web App. My name is Shunya. I'm a web ecosystem consultant at Google. And I'm Hadian, also a web ecosystem consultant at Google. We are hosts of the workshop today. We will walk through the code lab together. We will start with an existing web application and learn how to implement the APIs that Chrome natively supports that can make its navigation instant and the transition more seamless. Before we get started with our code wrap, I would like to ask Hadian to explain a little bit of what we mean by instant and seamless and why they are important. Certainly, Sunya. The APIs that fall under the instant and seamless program are created with the purpose of bringing a low friction engaging and intuitive user experience on the web. You have probably heard about Core Web Vitals, a set of metrics that measure real-world user experience for loading performance, interactivity, and visual stability of the page. We introduced Core Web Vitals because site speed is always an important aspect of user experience. There are three new instant loading APIs that we will learn in this code lab pre-rendering, back-forward cache, and private prefetch proxy. These APIs would help to improve Core Web Vitals score on your website in the field, especially for loading performance. And we will also cover a seamless transition API, the root shared element transitions. We have become accustomed to the intuitive navigation and state changes that mobile native apps offer. While it is possible to replicate such experience on the web, implementing it through the web platform APIs are often too difficult. Seamless APIs are designed to fill that kind of user and developer experience gap between app and web. As we learn about these instant and seamless APIs, please note that these APIs are still in their early stages. So there might be some bugs, limitations, and missing features as of today. API services might also change in the future. That is why we would really welcome your feedback and bug report that you can submit through crbug.com. Now that we are all aligned with the definition of instant and seamless, Shunya, shall we start with our code lab? All right, let's dive into the code lab. The sample web app is built with Next.js, which is a popular JavaScript framework. The app is intentionally made from MPA, multi-page application part, and SPA, single-page application part, for demo purpose. We will implement pre-rendering and the backward cache for MPA pages and shared element transition for SPA pages. What you need Firstly, you need a browser that supports the APIs, Chrome version 101 or above, a knowledge of HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and how to use Chrome DevTools. Next, we are going to enable Chrome flags. You can open the browser and type chrome chrome slash slash flags to the address bar. We will enable two flags one is for pre-rendering, and the other one is for shared element transitions. Those APIs are implemented behind the flag, which are not enabled by default. We can restart the browser once the flags are enabled. After you enable the Chrome flags and restart the browser, then download the source code. We are hosting the source code on GitHub. So you can run the git cron command to download. Please specify the branch name by passing the B option to the command. The branch name is CodeRab. Once you downloaded the source code, then run the npm install command and npm run dev command. Then the app will start on your local server. We run npm run dev command in the terminal and see if the server is running. 
Yes, the server has started. Now we are ready to add new INDES features. So we can start from pre-rendering. As the name implies, this is about pre-loading, rendering, and running a web page before the user actually navigates to it. The main goal of pre-rendering is to ideally achieve near instant navigation. In this code lab, we will apply pre-rendering for same origin URLs. You can read this web.dev article, web.dev slash speculative dash pre-rendering that explains about pre-rendering in great detail. To achieve the near instant experience, a pre-rendered page is created when the browser acts on a hint to pre-render a URL. The content is loaded into a pre-rendering browsing context, a new type of browsing context that can be thought of as a browser tab that is not yet shown to the users. When users navigate to that URL, the pre-rendering browsing context is activated. From the user's perspective, activation acts like an instantaneous navigation because it does not require a network round trip, creation of a document, or running JavaScript initialization, like a normal navigation. All of those things have already been done in the pre-rendering browsing context. I also mentioned earlier that the browser needs a hint to pre-render a URL. This is done through the Speculation Rules API. You can learn more about this in this GitHub page, github.com slash WICG slash nevspeculation. And if you find out about the Speculation Rules section, you will be able to find that speculation rules is a new way to declare what kind of speculation the browser may do about future user activity. In this case, an outgoing navigation. You can use this API to tell the browser which links to pre-render. The speculation rules is JSON object included within a script tag that can be inlined or loaded in externally. Just before we start working on pre-rendering, I would like to highlight two things. One, pre-rendering requires more device and network resources that resource hints like pre-connect, pre-fetching, and the others are doing. So please be mindful when selecting the URL to pre-render. You should analyze your user navigation pattern and only pre-render the URL that your users are most likely to navigate to. You should also avoid pre-rendering pages like the checkout, add to cart, login, or logout pages. The second point is that the current pre-rendering origin trial only accepts one same origin URL to pre-render per page. With that, Shunya will now show you how to integrate pre-rendering into the sample app. Shunya? All right, let's implement the pre-rendering feature into the sample app. We are going to add the feature to the list of vegetable page. For the demo purpose, the response time of the vegetable detail page is very slow by having a delay on the server side. We can eliminate this, this waiting time by using pre-rendering. First, let's add a new button to the list of vegetable page that will trigger pre-rendering once a user clicks it. We will start from making a new button component as the first step. So we can copy and paste the code snippet from the code app and create a new file. We can create a new file on the components directory and naming Pre-render button.js and paste it. Basically, this pre-render component renders a button element and triggers the handle click function when the user clicks the button. Inside the function, we capture the URL of the next page and pass it to the dispatch function. We import resource context here. 
This is a predefined feature in this web app. It manages global states by using React context. The pre-render URL is managed in resource context, and it will be used for making a speculation rules component once it's updated. Once we create the pre-render button component, then we import it into the list item component. It's a component for list, list items in the list pages. So let's open the list item.js and we can uncomment here and here. So we import the pre-render button and uh, use it on list item for MPA function. Next, we are going to make another new component, which is speculation rules component. This component will insert a speculation rules script tag into the HTML to trigger pre-rendering. We create a new file under the component directory and named speculation rules dot js and paste it. So in this code, we make custom script tag by using script component provided by Next.js. This component will insert a script tag once the pre-rendered URL global state has changed. Then import the script speculation rules component into our app.js. Let's open the app.js and we can import speculation rules component here and uncomment this line. Now we've implemented the basic feature of pre-render. Let's check how it works on the browser. So we have pre-render button here, and without pre-rendering, the navigation to detail page takes a very long time, like this. After clicking the button, the pre-rendering process has started in the background, and it results in the page loading instantly, like this. Yes, it works. We successfully open the next page without waiting for the loading and rendering time. It looks great. Thanks, Sunya. As you work on implementing pre-rendering on our sample app, there is one sticky question on top of my head. What happens with the JavaScript on the page that are pre-rendered but not yet activated? Do they run at all? That's a good point, Hadian. You should be careful of which script on the pre-rendered page because they will be run even before user navigates to the pre-rendered page. Let's take an example of the analytics script. Page view events should only be sent when the user actively visits and visually sees the website, not the time when the website is pre-rendered but not activated yet. Let's open analytics.js under public directory. By default, Analytics.js in the sample web app sends a page view event in the DOM content loaded event handler. Unfortunately, this is not wise because this event will fire during the pre-rendered phase. So let's make this Analytics.js to be pre-render aware. We introduce document.prerendering property and the pre-rendering change event here. A document can tell it being pre-rendered with the document.prerendering property. Upon navigation, the pre-rendering change event is dispatched to the document. We go back to the editor. First, we should change analytics.js not to send page view event if the page is pre-rendered but not activated yet. 
we can put the document dot pre rendering property check in the send event function. Basically, we can uncomment here. This send event function is called on in the doc DOM content loaded event. If the page is pre rendered but still not activated, the property returns true. So we can simply return in that case. The next point is we need to send the page view event when the pre rendering page, pre rendered page is activated. Since the pre rendered page already finished the DOM content loaded event, we use the pre rendering change event in this case. So let's uncomment this lines. This event is triggered when the pre rendered page is activated and the user actually opens the page. And we call send event function inside the event handler. Now we are changed the analytics code to be pre render aware. Let's check how it works on the browser. You can open the dev tools and click the console tab. We can see the event is sent when the page is opened, like this. And click the pre-render button. And click the link. Yes, we are seeing the page activation log first, and then the page view event. That works correctly. The page view event is sent exactly when we activate the pre-rendered page. All right, moving on to the next instant navigation API, the backward cache. The backward cache, or BF cache, is a browser optimization that enables instant back and forward navigation. Chrome data shows that around 1 in 10 navigations on desktop and around 1 in 5 on mobile are either back or forward navigation. BF cache is different from the HTTP cache. HTTP cache contains only the responses such as HTML, CSS, JavaScript for previous made HTTP requests, while BF cache is an in-memory cache that store a complete snapshot of a page, including a JavaScript heap. With BF cache enabled, loading the previous page is essentially instant because the entire page can be restored from the memory without having to go to the network at all, nor having to re-render the page either. We can check the comparison video on the web.dev article. There are lots of factors for BF cache eligibility. Please check out web.dev BF cache to get an in-depth detail about the common BF cache blockers. And in this workshop, Hadian will take you through how to unblock the top two BF cache blockers, the unload event handler and cache control no store HTTP header. Our sample app has an unnecessary unload event handler. It is a common mistake to use an unload event because it is unreliable. It does not always fire on mobile platforms and Safari. Now we can remove this unload event from our sample app. The unload event is triggered from public slash analytics.js file. We are now replacing this unload event with a page height event instead. Page height event is much more reliable because it fires in all cases when the unload event fires and it also fires when a page is put in BF cache. This is the first blocker and let's move on to the second blocker. The second blocker that we want to remove is the cache control no store HTTP header. 
we will call it the CCNS header. If a page does not contain personalized or critical information, like in the case of our sample app, we probably don't need to serve our page with the CCNS HTTP header because the page will not benefit from the browser's BF cache feature. Because right now our sample app is run locally with the next dev command, the Next.js library overrides its HTTP header with CCNS header in order to prevent local caching for development and debugging purposes. To confirm this, we can use the Networks tab in DevTools to check the HTTP header of our sample app. If we pick up the DevTools, Network tab, let's reload our sample app. And we can see that there is a cache control no store header here. So now as an exercise in this a code lab, we can declare a cache control public HTTP header in two files to be able to see how BF cache impacts these two pages when we navigate back and forward between them. Let's go back to our code editor and let's work on the vegetable index page. In here, we have prepared the set header function call that we can uncomment. And you can see that we are calling the cache control public header here. So that's the first file. And the second file that we are going to modify is the detail page of each of the vegetable. Vegetable slash name.js. So similarly, we have prepared a set header function call here. And we can just uncomment this line save it and now we have these two pages explicitly calling cache control public header now that those codes are in place the next step is to stop our dev server which i'm doing at the bottom of the screen here and then we can run an npm run build command to make our production build it may take a couple of seconds to complete the building now that we have build the production build, we will run our production build with npm run start. Everything looks good on the production build. So now we can head back to our browser and we can reload our vegetable page. Once again, we look at the network tab in the DevTools console now we can inspect that the cache control is set to public. Let's also inspect the vegetable detail page. As Sonia mentioned, there is some delay that we especially put in for this sample app. And we also see that it is setting the cache control to public. So now let's see whether the BF cache is in place. Now, if we move back with our browser back button and then move forward again, we can see that the page load is really different now, don't you think? We are seeing a near instant experience here because the page is loaded from BF cache. That's it. We have successfully removed the two main BF cache blockers, the unload event handler and CCNS HTTP header. I would like to mention that the Chrome team proposes that pages with CCNS HTTP header are stored in BF cache in some scenarios, such as when there are no cookie changes. You can check the details of this proposal by following this URL in our code lab. That looks great, but I have two questions. How can we gather the stats of pages that are restored from BF cache. Also, after we remove the blockers, how can we debug if the page is now eligible for BF cache? Is that an easy way to check? Those are great questions. First of all, I would like to note that the main analytics tools and Chrome user experience report are aware of BF cache. But we also want to show you that you can use a property called persisted in the page show event to show whether a page is restored from BF cache or not. 
Let's head back to the public slash analytics JS file on our sample app. You can see that we have prepared a code block here for the page show event. So we can just uncomment this block. And in this page show event handler, there is a persisted event, which only returns true when the page is restored from BF cache. So in, inside this persisted event code block, you can run any ping to your in-house analytics tool. Or in this case, we are just sending a message to the dev console. This should do it. Now let's see the page show event handler in action in our browser. So previously, there is no event when the page was loaded from BF cache. Now let's reload our pages. This is the vegetable index page and then the detail page of the vegetable. Now, if we go back to the previous page, we can see this message that we just added. The page was restored from BF cache. Same goes if we go forward. This page now has the page restored from BF cache message that we have added inside the page show event handler. Now you can gather any statistics that you want only when your page is restored from BF cache. And for your second question, Sunia, about how we can debug a page eligibility for BF cache, there is a dedicated testing tool in DevTools to help us identify any BF cache blockers. In DevTools, let's open the application step. And on the left side, you see the cache heading here. Underneath, you will find the back forward cache testing. So inside this tool, we can use this test back forward cache button. We click on it the page will reload. And if the page is successfully restored from BF cache, you will see this message here, successfully served from back forward cache. Otherwise, it will list down the BF cache blockers. For example, when the page has the unload handler or cache control no store HTTP header like what we discussed earlier. I hope this answers your question, Sunya. Yes, certainly. They are clear now. Thanks, Hadian. So we have pre-rendering and BF cache in the app, but what about the user experience when user navigates from other sites, such as Google search page? Let me introduce the concept of prefetch. Basically, prefetching speeds up navigation by starting fetches early so that the response are already at the browser when the user navigates. However, when it is done with a naive approach, there is a trade-off in which user information, such as their interest or IP address, would be revealed to the publishers before the user decides to navigate. That's not good from the privacy perspective. The private prefetch proxy solved this problem. Private prefetch proxy enables cross-site prefetch without revealing private information about the user to the destination server. This proxy never sends cookies or other personally identifiable information. Also, it hides the browser, it hides the user IP address via HTTP2 connect proxy. As it is shown in the animated image in our code lab. Prefetches are end-to-end -end encrypted between Chrome and the origin. The proxy only knows the hostname of the destination. The private prefetch proxy is now provided an early access program. By opting in, Chrome will try to prefetch the links to your website on the Google search page if it's eligible. Please keep in mind that these are the instructions for the current state of the private prefetch proxy at the time of recording. For the latest, please refer this URL, goo.gre slash p3-info. 
Hadian will now take you through on what we have to do to get the benefit from this technology. There is a new resource called Traffic Advice that allows site owners to control how the site responds to private prefetch proxy requests. For example, if you need to temporarily opt out or if you want to limit the prefetching connections. You can think about Traffic Advice as something similar to your robots.txt file, which gives directives to web crawlers when it crawls your site. During the early access program, we are also using this traffic advice to opt in to the private prefetch proxy. Let's add this resource to our sample app. We have to add it under the public slash well-known directory. Now we are creating a new file here and call it traffic-advice. Now that the file is created, let's take the sample code snippet from our code lab. Let's copy from here and paste it to our newly created file. As you can see, the file content is actually a JSON configuration. In this case, Google Prefetch Proxy EAP is a special field to opt into the early access program. And the fraction is a field to control the fraction of private prefetch proxy requests. Just one more thing. The traffic advice also needs to be written with a specific MIME type. That's why we need to configure the response header of our sample app in the next.config.js file here. Since we have prepared the code block, let's uncomment this. And now you can see that whenever the browser requests for the traffic advice file, it will be written with the content type that is set to application slash traffic advice plus JSON like we are setting here. Since we updated the next.js config file, we need to stop our server again, which I'm doing at the terminal at the bottom of the screen. And then let's restart it with the npm run dev command to start our dev server again. Looks like the survey started, so let's head back to our browser and check whether the traffic advice file is in place. As you can see, the traffic advice file is now served from our sample app. And let's inspect the network tab in DevTools. And we can see that the content type is as per what we have set just now application slash traffic advice plus JSON. That's about it. We have now opted in our sample app to use private prefetch proxy. What do you think, Sunya? Wow, that's a very simple process to opt in the EAP. We can get the benefit of prefetching and that would improve the core web vital score in the field. As we mentioned before, private prefetch proxy is still actively developed and the instruction might be changed in the future. Please check the latest status from the public GitHub repository when you work on it. Another option to enable cross-site prefetch is using signed exchange. We don't cover signed exchange at this workshop, but please take a look at the Google search documentation and web.dev articles for more details. There are lots of useful libraries and tools that makes it easy to build signed exchange on production. All right, so far we have covered the three instant navigation APIs. Now we will look at the seamless transition API, root shared element transition. On the web, when a user navigates from page A to page B, the content that they are looking at changes suddenly. And as page A disappears, then page B jumps into view. This sequence and disconnected user experience is forcing users to piece together how they got to where they come from. This jarring experience also increases how much users perceive the page loading as they wait for the destination page to load. Smooth loading animations can lower the cognitive load by helping users stay in context as they navigate between the pages. 
and also reduce the perceived latency of loading by providing users with something engaging and delightful in the meantime. For these reasons, most platforms such as Android, iOS, and Windows provide easy-to-use primitives that enable developers to build seamless transitions. The Root Shared Element Transitions API provides developers with the same capability on the web, regardless of whether the transitions are cross-document in multi-page application or intra-document in single-page application. All right, let's integrate the shared element transition into the SPA part of the sample app. The list of root page and detail page are built with SPA. So we apply the shared element transition between those two types of pages. First of all, let's open the global.css file. Basically, shared elements need a special CSS, which is the contain property in CSS. And we set paint as the value of the property. This property allows elements to make a new stacking context and implies that descendants of the elements don't apply outside of its bounds. That is a requirement for shared element. Before diving into the sample app code, let me explain a little bit about the transition object, which is the new JavaScript API provided by the shared element transitions. Basically, we can split the transition process into two steps. The first step is preparing the transition. On the first page, we create the transition object by calling the document.createDocumentTransition method. And we register an element as shared element by transition.setElement method. And then, we call the start method. That's the first step. It should be done on the start page before moving to the next page. The second step is making a page transition. Once the start method is called, the browser tries to capture snapshot for the registered elements. We update the DOM and switch to the next page inside the start function. After switching to the next page, we register the element by using the set element again. So we are registering the elements in both start page and next page. By doing so, those two elements are considered as a shared element during the page transition in the browser. When the callback finishes, the animation will start and we will see the seamless navigation between two pages. So, how can we integrate it into Next.js or React component lifecycle? In order to manage that kind of workflow inside the sample app, we use some custom hooks in React. Let's open usePageTransition.js. So basically, we have two custom hook. One is use page transition prep, and the other is use page transition. These two custom hooks implement the workflow that I explained before. As I mentioned, the start method needs to be called on the first page, and the next page needs to be rendered inside the callback function. To make this happen, we are using a promise in the use page transition prep hook in order to defer the callback function being resolved not on the first page, but on the next page. We pass the resolver function from the start page to the next page. We call use page transition prep on the first page, which is the list page in the sample app, and we call the use page transition hook on the second page, which is the detail page. Let's open the list item.js file and import the use page transition prep hook. You can uncomment here. Then we 
check list item for SPA component, we receive the function that trigger the transition start method from the hook and call it inside the click event. We can uncomment these lines. Inside the function, the shared element class elements are collected and registered as shared elements. Now we've finished the work on the first page. Moving on to the next page that receives the transition object. Let's open the name.js and the fruit directory. On this detail page, we call use page transition hook to finish transition start callback function. We can uncomment here and replace the line here. So we set the ref object here. It will be used inside the custom hook in order to access the actual DOM with using use ref hook in React. All right, we've done the shared element transition integration. Let's check the browser and see how it works. Let's open the demo again. So basically we expect images between the list and detail page to be registered as shared elements and make smooth transition with animation. Yes, it works. We've now achieved a seamless transition on the sample app. That is the basic integration of Shared Element Transition API. If you want to customize the animation more, you can use the CSS PSDO classes. Please check out the explainer for more details. Congratulations for making it to the end of our code lab and creating a low friction, engaging, and intuitive web app. We hope you had a fun time going through this code lab with us. As mentioned in the beginning of our code lab, these APIs are still in their early stages. So we would like to share these great references that you can follow to get the latest updates and learn more. We would once again invite you to submit your feedback through the GitHub pages of each API or through crbug.com. There is also a great deep dive session about root shared element transitions with Jake Archibald. Do check it out and many other interesting I.O. sessions as well. Sampai jumpa. Terima kasih. Arigatou gozaimashita.